Any has anybody has any questions or curiosities left about Ibris? Hope so. At the Okay, then we leave the bosonic word. Now, uh, I have to confess, I think it's going to be a little bit challenging to describe superstrings, considering that you, you have not seen most of your supersymmetry before, as far as, in, as I can see from the syllabus. So, today I will just go to, a, to an example which uh, optimistically will tell you both what's behind the definition of superstring theory and perhaps give you a first example of a supersymmetric theory. Uh, now, it's not exactly a, uh, you know, the, the first supersymmetric uh, theory you find in the textbook, but it's, uh, it's interesting. So, the starting point will be essentially parallel to the first lecture. So I'm going to, I would like to ask, suppose I have a theory, a quantum field theory, with fermions. So I look at my Feynman diagrams, there are Feynman, there are Dirac propagators. I would like to rewrite those in the same sort of uh, Schrodinger time formalism and then pass integral over some embeddings from a, of a particle in space time. So the starting point is the Dirac propagator, which uh, in momentum space for a massless particle. It's roughly something like that. So I give a massless particle example. If you want to find that to, to know how to do a massive particle, you can just dimensionally reduce. Take one of the components of the momentum and the mass. You can throw away the direction of space time. So in order to get this sort of propagator from a first quantized formalism, I need to find some way to describe the gamma matrices. Now, as I indicated last time, every time I want to get something more complicated than the scalar, I will, I will have to enrich the quantum mechanics of my single particle in such a way that the Hilbert space of the single particle gets the extra structure that I want. So in this particular case, we need to sort of enrich the quantum mechanics of a particle moving in space-time with some degrees of freedom, which can give me gamma matrices. And with a, such that the Hilbert space of this particle somehow will become a spinner. So to do that, I'm going to introduce fermionic variables in my quantum mechanics. With standard commutation relations. So it should be clear that as soon as I quantize this from fermionic variables, I get gamma matrices. So that size will play the role of gamma matrices. So how do I rewrite this in terms of this? It is a freedom. I mean, so I, I will refer to the size and to the gammas interchangeably. Okay? Sometimes I write them as gamma, sometimes as, as psi depending if I want to imagine them as just operators out of my Hebrew space, <coughs> or perhaps as some variables to be quantized. So we know how to write the 1 over p squared. So how do we write the p, p mu, gamma mu? Well, let me introduce a second integral auxiliary variable, Gerstmann on. So when I do the integral over tau, I get 1 over p squared. When I do the integral over zeta, I just move down this factor. Now, why, why is this interesting? 
let's look at the at this two quantities. So let p squared, which essentially I want to identify with the Hamiltonian of my uh, quantum mechanical system. And then with this guy, let me call it Q. The main property of this guy is that Q squared equal to H. Which in particular, and, and also Q commutes with H. So my quantum mechanics sort of has two nice conserved quantities, two, two symmetries. There's a time translation symmetry. There's some other bizarre Grassmann odd symmetry which squares the time translations. Whenever you have something like that, this is called a supersymmetry. So a supersymmetric theory is the theory which has ex some extra Grassmann odd charges, which roughly square to your time translation or in general translation. This means that I can write this, this quantity as e to the minus tau h minus zeta q. So, roughly speaking, this is a this is something that represents translations in time, and it's some sort of a weird super time, just an observation of time. Mm -hmm. uh, is Q a grasp of the odd variable? Yes. So why have we let that Q squared be called the half? Well, it's, it's an operator. So the same way as bosonic variables commute, but bosonic operators might not commute. Thermonic variables anti-commute, but fermionic operators might have an interesting anti-commutator. So this is essentially the anti-commutator of Q and Q. I, I shouldn't be thinking about it as a grasp of operators. It's, a, it's, a, it's an operator. It's really an operator. Some operator that has anti-commutation. Yes. Now here P was a variable, but as soon as we, w as we go to Fourier space, so as, as, good, as we did in the first lecture, we fully transform, we integrate over the momenta, keeping into account the endpoints. Ah. So after you do the Fourier transform, everything. So you can try, P, P becomes an operator acting on, on axis. We can essentially write this. In this form. So if you take a standard quantum mechanics with whose variables are positions and size, and I define my piece by the usual commutation relations. Okay. Then I can write my direct propagator in this form. So this became a, an integral of a proper time and some weird fermionic generalization of it, of a, a transition amplitude from a, some initial point, the time zero, super time zero, to some final point at time tau and super time zeta.
And now the plan is to try to write this also as a, as a nice pattern table over the. Uh, no, the first step is pretty simple. Uh, we, we know the variables. Uh, it's, it's something standard. We just do the, write this as a pattern table over x and psi with some action. Uh, but uh, what's really interesting is to try to do the same thing we have for a standard particle, which is to promote tau to the zero mode of a, uh, remember in, in the, the first lecture, so for the standard, for the particle, for the scalar particle. The final expression we, we started working with was something like E inverse x dot squared plus E square m plus E m squared the u right? with the parameterization and parameterization invariance uh, such that E the u goes to E prime the u prime and then we fix uh, different physics. by e equal to tau, verifying e to be constant. This is what we did. So let's see if we can do the same thing, but in this context of supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So I want to have, essentially, freedom to parameterize my time and super time by some local coordinates, and freedom of changing coordinates. So I'm going to introduce some coordinates u and theta, Grassman even and Grassman odd. And I'm going to try to define some supersymmetric version of diffeomorphisms. So one way to think about diffeomorphisms is that they are, act, uh, they are transformations that act in this interesting way on derivatives. Uh, in, in this case, uh, it's useful to introduce a notion of super, oh, sorry, let me say this right. It, even before we, we think in terms of this u and theta, right, we just look at this expression, and we call that g of tau and zeta. This is the following properties. First of all, the tau g equal to minus h g. Now, to understand what happens in the theta, theta some zeta derivatives, it's useful to expand it. So it's 1 minus zeta q e to the minus h tau. Right? So in the deal of the zeta, I get a q uh, by itself. To get something interesting, I need to do d over the zeta minus zeta uh, plus zeta d over the tau. So that gives me uh, minus q. Sorry. E to the minus h tau. Remember, zeta squared is zero because zeta is a Grassmann variable. So minus zeta h e to the minus h tau. Uh, so plus, okay, which is the same as minus q g. The right. Uh, actually, I really need to do the plus here because if I do qg, there is q zeta q, and it to pass q across zeta to get zeta q squared. So this actually means that a lot of the signs that I write down in the rest of the lectures are suspicious, because <laughs> <laughs> of course I did my uh, calculations with the wrong sign. 
on the other hand, I would probably get other signs wrong while writing, so they might cancel out. <laughs> okay, so this shows you that sort of the, the natural way to think about <coughs> time translations is just the usual et al. But super time translations are implemented by this operator. So if I want to generalize this to some sort of uh, <coughs> diffeomorphism and super diffeomorphism, well, the diffeomorphisms are generated by vector fields, so they'll be generated by some operator like that. We call that delta v. And super diffeomorphisms will be generated by something like this. Let's see if this definition makes sense. So it would be nice to check that all sort of commutator and commutator of these transformations close to transformations of the same sort. For example, suppose I do delta epsilon, delta epsilon prime. Actually, it's really commutator because epsilon is gas mass. Oh. Classification to a consideration of the gas man in or gas man odd. Debatable. Let's say it's gas man gas man odd. Okay. So uh, what do I get? I get epsilon. Uh, so the first thing to observe is that if I take this guy and I squared it. I get actually uh, chu the tau. Sorry, the tau. Because uh, well, almost everything cancels out. First thing I get is simply something like epsilon, epsilon prime, true epsilon, epsilon prime, uh, the u. Second thing I get is when the derivative, the u derivative, actually acts on on the on the generator. So that gives me something like epsilon theta epsilon prime. The theta. So let me move theta on the other side. Uh, plus the one we've exchanged. This shows me that actually this definition was not quite good. It was a tentative definition. Uh, but see, when I anti when I anti commute to these guys, I get something somewhat more complicated. Now notice that the thing in parentheses is actually half of the derivative of this. So let me amend this definition. I thought you were computing the 
the algebra. Vector. Yes. But I guess you were, but then you just said the anti, the, did you compute the anti commutator? Or the commutator. This the one's commutator. the commutator. Oh, okay. That's yes. So I treat that epsilon as also a node parameter. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, but here you're just computing the algebra. That's right. Okay. So after my amendment, this looks like delta of true epsilon epsilon prime. Now I should show you that this guy, this guy does something nice, and uh, this guy itself does something nice. Um, instead, I'll just show you that this is really the symmetry of something, and so it will be a good. So <coughs> these are the these two generators represent the transformations which uh, act in a nice way on something called the superderivative. which is defined almost as this, but with opposite sign. So the superderivative has the property that it actually commutes with this operator, and it commutes with this operator. <coughs> and it squares minus uh, standard derivative. So uh, is that a commutator or anti-commutator on the right? It's both. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Actually, you joke about it, but there is a com there is a convention in which you write Things with one curly and one square, and that means do commutator or anti commutator, depending if the arguments are uh, <laughs> both odd or, or not. So, if you do a transformation of the theta, because almost everything goes through, all you get is actually. Uh, let's see. Do it right. Uh, well, there is no hope I get the sign right anyway. Uh, but write it like that, which is also the same as minus the u epsilon the theta, theta the theta. So this is a transformation which multiplies the theta by something. So if you act, keep acting with sort of transformations, right? if I keep doing several transformations of this sort, I will always end up with multiples of the theta. Because they, they are, if I do another transformation, it either acts on this and leaves the theta there, or it acts on the theta and it gets something that still has the theta. Which in particular means that the delta V also ends up multiplying the theta by something. And in general, these are the most general transformations with this property. So a way to think about super is that they are transformations which, when they commute with this superderivative, they just multiply it by something. So let me write it up somewhere. one-dimensional super diffeomorphisms are transformations with the property that 
that is giving back the theta. Now, if you, if, if you at some point you learn some super geometry and super manifolds and things like that, then uh, if there are manifolds with even or not coordinates, you can define vector fields on these manifolds. So on these manifolds, there are vector fields, the u and the theta. And somehow this is a, uh, this, the theta is sort of a, a special direction inside this tangent space of the manifold. And we only consider coded transformations which preserve this direction. OK. Um, so all of this was just to try to figure out what is a reasonable way to transform my excess and size in the quantum mechanics. So I'm going to combine excess and size into something that's called a superfield. And I'll just use, define the action of these vector fields or the superfield just in the standard way. So, for example, delta epsilon of y, <coughs> I'm just going to act with uh, delta epsilon and get epsilon psi plus epsilon theta du x, which means that delta epsilon x is psi, epsilon psi. Delta epsilon psi is uh, minus epsilon value x. So this is the general structure of supersymmetric transformations. Uh, when you study supersymmetric quantum field theories, typically you have some bosons, some fermions, like a scalar field, some fermions. And the variation of the scalar field leads to the fermion. The variation of the fermion is the derivative of the scalar field. So you encounter this in higher dimension too. This is sort of the one dimensional toy model of that. And then you can wonder, how do I write an action which is invariant under these transformations? Okay. So there is a way to do these things using superspace, meaning you do, you really write your action as an integral over both u and theta of something. Uh, but for now, let me just do it by hand. So I, want to, my, I want my action to start with some x dot squared. E inverse. Okay. Now I want to start adding, keep adding pieces to this until I find something that is invariant under super diffeomorphisms. So if I do a super diffeomorphism over, over on this, what do I get? Oh, first of all, I, I might make a variation of my auxiliary variable. I don't know what that is going to be yet. So let's leave it unspecified. And then, uh, I should probably put a one half. Okay. And then I vary x dot. So it gives me equal to inverse x dot, and then the u of epsilon psi. Which means the u epsilon psi plus epsilon the u psi upside off. Now, let's look at this last term. In order to cancel it, well, I know how to produce a psi dot, an x dot. So I could start, start by ask, adding uh, e inverse psi psi dot. Uh, 
actually, let me put a, again, uh, one half. So what is the variation of this? Can vary psi or can vary psi dot, or I can vary the inverse again. I'm going to integrate these both parts. Uh, so part of it. Let me just do it. Uh, when I integrate these both parts, one of the terms gives me again this x dot psi dot. that and get rid of the one half. Then the possibility is plus this with the derivative of this. Uh, I'm already starting to get the signs wrong, so I, I surrender. Okay. Okay, so we start this allowed us to cancel this term because we generate all sorts of other terms. But actually, we can get rid of a lot of the other terms by adding yet another object. Uh, so I write it like this. <coughs> I'm going to add a new variable. Is going to be sort of the super partner of, the, of E. Then I run the transformation law for that one to make this work. So this will give me uh, the U epsilon uh, psi, 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 but that will cancel out because psi is in field. Then I get epsilon psi dot. Type sign. I get the variation of chi, whatever it is, and then I get the variation of psi. See if you can make things cancel out nicely. Uh, we're left with a bunch of psi dot x dot psi terms. I'm going to cancel them with the variation of the gravity norm. So I'm going to use my delta chi to cancel out this term. Out this term. Yeah, don't believe this side. And I'm going to use the variation of the of my e 
guy. To cancel out a bunch of other things. See, here I got back in x dot square and psi dot psi. So this looks like the action. And this is exactly what was multiplying delta the inverse. So So these are the sort of supersymmetry transformations I need uh, to make the whole action invariant under super diffeomorphisms. So now we did the, the first example of something called supergravity. Which is the theory of gravity and supersymmetry. Uh, one dimensional. Mm -hmm. Is there a natural way to just simply write down the section without having to add the counter terms? Like yes, in this case there is. So first of all, we need to somehow combine these guys into some sort of a super field as well. Uh, so I think roughly the super field would look like this. Uh, okay. So if I do the variation of this super field, I get half left and times. Plus theta of inverse theta u epsilon uh, plus minus uh, one half uh, theta epsilon the u theta minus one. So I think this can be written partly as epsilon uh, <coughs> the theta uh, plus theta the u. So this is roughly the same thing that you found in front of the transformation of uh, the theta. So uh, in a sense, so in the same way, can I say this? When you do the thermophysms on 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 E. So E is like the square root of the metric. E squared really is like a metric. So it transforms, it carries indices. So this super symmetric guy oh, carries some indices in one dimensions. And this gives you the extra transformation term. Carries an index of the same type as the theta. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect often we're going to split these y's to be the guys I'm going to put in my action. But uh, those x's, when they were bosonic, they were nice and they had like uh, Poincare variants and all that. What happened to. They still have Poincare in mind. Well, that, isn't that theta going to ruin things? No. I put the Lorentz index on both. So this is a. You can think of this as a map from some funny one dimensional super manifold to standard space time. I've not done anything strange and supersymmetric to space time. Space time is still the usual bosonic space time, but the world line has been supersymmetrized. 
So it's easy to write down the current for the for Lorentz transformations. There's something like the, uh, the usual x mu p mu plus sine mu sine mu. So anyway, all of this will just say that, yes, this action can also be written as an integral over the, ta over the u, the theta, of something like the theta y, uh, the u, y, uh, oh, the theta square y, probably, uh, e, in, I think, I've not checked. I think if you expand this into components and your theta integral, you presumably get the action over there. But I'm going to check. So. You should definitely check this. Right, I, and I'm not sure this is completely true, OK? Uh, it's probably true, but I, I'm not. So there is there is whole theory of supergravity. So it is uh, often the case in supergravity. So you can either do things in components, or you can do things in superspace. And uh, <coughs> but how to actually do it in superspace is it's often rather subtle. It's more an art than a, than a science to so do supergravity in superspace. So I, I try to package things together in this E. I'm not actually sure it's the right way to do it. I didn't I didn't check it. I did this calculation by hand exactly because I didn't want to get into uh, supergravity in super space. So it's doable, but it takes a certain shape of mind. Uh, I mean, there, there is people whose profession is to write supergravity theories. Uh, it's really. In other dimension, it can get very complicated to write down an action which is invariant under super diffeomorphisms uh, and check that all the transformations end up closing. Uh, okay, so so what did we do? So we, 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 we ended up with some action, some nice action. Action of x, psi, e, and chi, which has super diffeomorphism invariant. Now, let's check that if we can gauge fix it to get something interesting. Now, from this transformation, it's probably not completely obvious, but the transformation of uh, e squared chi is actually a total derivative. See, x squared chi might be, in a sense, x squared chi is the guy that appears in if you invert this e. So you do e, this becomes e plus e squared chi theta chi, chi chi theta. So e squared chi, chi is really the super partner of e. If you remember, when I gauge fixed e, we kept the, the zero mode of e. So in a similar way here, when you do a super diffeomorphism, you can eliminate most of e squared chi, except for at zero mode. So you can use this to make e squared chi into constant 
which is mapping that the zeta to head up there. And after you do that, you can use diffeomorphisms to fix E to also be a constant. Tau. So after you do this gauge fixing, this action becomes something that was simple. really check me on this too. I'm not 100% sure. But uh, what you get here, after you rescale, rescale tau, so this end appears at the end here, uh, is supposed to give exactly Integral with this action is supposed to give exactly a uh, green function. So, roughly, this sort of first order action, side side dot, is the sort of thing you need to get anti commutation relations like that. So, when you quantize this, this action, you end up with the, the size become gamma matrices, x dot becomes p. This gives you Q, and this gives you the Hamiltonian. So anyway, enough about the super part, the spinning particle. Uh, all of this, besides giving you some examples of supersymmetry, was supposed to be an, an invitation to super strings, in the sense that the way, so there are several different ways to define super, super strings, uh, several different formalisms. Uh, there is one called the Grinchworth string, which has a sort of a normal worship, which moves in sort of a supersymmetric space time. Uh, unfortunately, that's very hard to quantize. Then there is something that's called uh, Neville Schwartz, Ramon, super string. Different way to realize the same theory. Where, where you, in, you may use something completely parallel to this. So you start with the supersymmetric worksheet. Embedded inside standard space time. Which means that you, so you, you have your, so your super worship means it, it's a watch it, it's equipped not just with the metric, but also with the gravity nodes. It's equipped with coordinates and super coordinates. And then this embedding. Is described by 
Oh, super fields. So we end up essentially with a theory of bosons and fermions coupled to some supersymmetric version of the matrix. Mm -hmm. so what are the indices of chi? Are we saying now we can have more? It's some spin or in, so uh, the gravitino is something that has a spin three halves. It has a vector index and a spin or index. <coughs> Your coordinates have a vector index or a spinner index. Now, the fact that the theta is a spinner can actually be seen already in 1D. If you look at how we define the diffeomorphisms, uh, let me just, is this line visible? Perhaps not. Uh, same. <coughs> See, this is a standard diffeomorphism together with a rotation or a scaling of theta. Theta is rescaled, but half of the amount would rescale a derivative or a vector. So already in 1D, theta was a 1D spinner. So here we, in 1D, we managed to do things without using 1D gamma matrices. Okay. Uh, in 2D to start to use through these spinners. Now, writing down the supergravity theory <coughs> coupled to these fields is a pain. It can be done, painful, uh, perhaps not very instructive. But the point is that this, this, this sort of setup still has one invariance. Actually, it has one invariance together with a supersymmetric generalization of that, which comes from committing uh, super Diffeomorphism with wire transformation. So this is super diffeomorphisms and super wire. Okay. So you can use when you, you can gauge fix, you can use this freedom to get rid completely of both the metric and the gravitino. So you can get fixed in such a way that gravitino is zero, and the metric is the usual diagonal metric. And you end up with something that is a, so you can do it locally, and then you need to glue the patches together. And the patches are glued together by super conformal transformations. Now, I don't want to discuss what 2D super diffeomorphisms are. That's complicated. But 2D super conformal transformations are very easy. They're just the holomorphic version of that. So you have some vari local variables, z <coughs> and theta, and some antelomorphic variables. And your code, super conformal transformations are basically, you know, v the z, the z, plus one half, uh, the z, v, theta, the theta, or the compass conjugate. And uh, epsilon of z. Uh, the theta plus theta, the z. OK, so they're really the supersymmetrization of the holomorphic coordinate transformation. All that is left from this gauge fixing, well, this gauge fixing has to be done properly, of course. Uh, so you have your ghosts, OK, and your. Mm -hmm. The thing you wrote to the right of the z theta coordinates, are those the, the generators of the superconformal that's transformation? Right. That's right. Okay. So they just look identical to the 1D ones we wrote. Uh, 
uh, except that they use holomorphic coordinates or anti-holomorphic coordinates. When, when you say you got super good here, morphism and super wild, is that for the, what's the form of the action? Is it the same as before, it's just wide and wide? It's a super gravity action, which, thought, which means I don't know it and I don't want to know it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to learn it at some point. But. Yeah. When we consider the bosonic string, we can either have closed strings or open strings, right? Yes. But here, same. When, you're, when you're adding a Grassmann variable, hmm? those uh, boundary conditions won't be like modified somehow? Uh, not that much. So now there is a stress tensor, and there is also a super stress tensor, a super current action, which comes from variations with respect to the gravitino. So we express some a boundary condition in terms of constraints on the stress tensor. In the super symmetric, super conformal setup, you have some constraints on the uh, super current. Again, the constraints are just the normal component equal to zero, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Don't you really use the, uh, the fact that we're using four strings to set uh, the delta of epsilon squared chi squared or chi to be a constant? Because we said it's a total variable, so we can. That was in 1D. Oh, I see, so in general. Uh, oh, right, the action. Okay. No, no, sorry, you. No, you, you're right. You're right. I shouldn't say chi equal to. Uh, should I say or not say? It is, it's a bit subtle. See? Uh, why did I say that you cannot get rid of the zero mode? Of course, you could if the dots, if your transformation was linear in, in you, right? So, in general, the question is can I really put chi to zero or not is global. Uh, locally, I can. The same way as I can make, put, put a metric in this form only locally. Globally, I cannot. And these super conformal transformations uh, patch together different coordinate systems with, with this uh, gauge choice, I think. Again, I've not done this in, in detail myself, uh, but that's what. Understand uh, is the story. Is epsilon here? Is it Grassmann values or is it or is it a uh, Grassmann? I took epsilon. Is it a it's a bit of a convention. If you take a Grassmann value, then these are. Uh, uh, these, these transformations are all bosonic. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, it's a, it's a Grassmann variable. Um, okay, so, so as I was saying, this gauge fixing is going to give us some ghosts. And some super ghosts, usually denoted at beta gamma. Uh, and this, this Gauss and super Gauss will essentially combine together with all the matter fields to give us some BRST charge, which will uh, which will, among other things, will implement the equations of motions for the metric and gravity that we got rid of. So, uh, see. Right, so if you remember in the bosonic string, that right, we had some negative norm state because we had an X naught. And then the BST uh, quantization, the restriction to physical states, modulo null states, got rid of those negative norm states. Now, because there is a psi naught as well, that also gives. Negative no states. And those are killed by 
these other physical state conditions that come from G. So your physical states are, are going to be killed by the Fourier modes of T and the Fourier modes of G. Uh, okay. So now, see, once we, got, once we get here, everything is good. The action is going to be free, quadratic. These are going to be free fields. They're going to be free fields, free fields, free fields. The, the square ghosts are still a bit of a pain to, to describe sometimes because, uh, well, for various reasons. But it's doable. It's all doable with free fields. Uh, the physical state conditions are then straightforward imposed. Or if you want to do things properly, you can use your BST charge. Again, painful, but doable. Uh, so there is nothing, no mystery left on the, on the worksheet. Of course, if you want, when you do loop calculations, things can still get uh, complicated conceptually because you need to think about all the possible ways to patch up together a super manifold out of these sort of flat patches with super conformal transformations. There's a certain theory of superhuman surface that one has to understand to study loop calculations. But at three level, not really. So in the next lecture, we'll hopefully be able to just sketch you know, the very basic first steps of the analysis of superstring theory. Um, we will not be able to compute the wild anomaly of all of this stuff. So I can just tell you now. So this we knew it was minus 26. This turns out to be plus 11. This was plus 1. And the Fermi's give plus 1 half. So this theory makes sense as a quantum theory if the dimension is 10. So if mu goes from 0 to 9. And similarly, I won't be able to compute things like you know, the Casimir energy of the, of the ground state. So, but if, if you allow me to just give those, then we can just do the standard analysis of uh, physical state conditions and at least find, figure out what is the spectrum of super strings. Sort of